Hey everybody, I am having way too much fun reading your comments. I almost forgot to go live. Okay, not really, but thank you so much for joining me. I'm Angela Walters, and this is the live kickoff for the newest free motion challenge, Quilting Along, help, how do I quilt it? I have to tell you, I have been practicing some different ways of saying that, but they all look pretty weird. But you know that feeling, right? When you're like, I finished this quilt top, and you're like, yay, it's done. And then you're thinking, oh no, now I have to quilt it. So that's really what inspired this whole challenge. I thought it would be great to give you practical tips for picking designs for your quilts. In, in fairness though, that's a question I'm asked a lot. So I'm pretty, pretty um, aware that that's a problem for most of us. In fact, I still struggle with it myself. I call it quilter's amnesia. You know, it happens when you forget all the quilting designs you've ever learned. Now that's different than the quilter's amnesia that happens when you go to a quilt shop and forget all the fabric you have at home. That one's not curable, but the first one is. So what I wanna do in this live challenge is just give you some practical tips for picking designs. So in, I'm gonna do a little bit of a slideshow, a little bit of a presentation, and then of course, open it up to Q&A and then uh, kind of tell you what's in store for you next week. First of all, I wanna tell you, um, I'll answer questions towards the end, but there have been a couple of questions that have come up. I just wanna address those real quick. Um, we do have the panel, we do have the kit. We're out of the thread right now, but we will get it back soon. Um, but really excited and next week is when the tutorial part actually starts so you can go ahead and leave your comments in or your questions in the comment section i have wonderful wendy here a friend and employee kind of keeping an eye on those kind of help you know so i don't miss them and we're going to have just a great time going over some of this stuff so you ready to see some pictures okay so when you're looking at your quilts and you're trying to decide how to quilt it the one thing i want you to know is that there's not one perfect answer I know you're looking at the quilt, or at least I should say, I'm looking at the quilt, I'm waiting for it to talk to me, waiting for it to tell me how I should quilt it, although I will tell you no quilts have actually talked to me, no matter how much wine I drink at night. But the thing is, there's not that one perfect answer. You know, there's not that one way to quilt it where the clouds part and the angels sing the hallelujah chorus over you, that's not it at all. There's a lot of great options. And it really depends on your preferences, who you're quilting it for, what machine you're using, all those kind of things. But at the end of it, when you're done, you have a finished quilt. And that's always better than a perfect quilt top. So if you're looking at your quilt and you're thinking, oh, I don't know what to do to get started, just get started because you'll have a beautiful quilt when you're done. Now that's easy for me to say, right? I've been quilting for a few years. I've picked out a lot of designs. I know what works for me, what doesn't work for me. Well, I wanna give you some practical tips and hopefully that will help make it a little bit easier to manage. So I put together just a real quick little slideshow for you just to go over some of the things that I wanna show you. So when you're looking at your quilt top and you're trying to decide how do I quilt this, the best thing to do is to start thinking about what's the most important thing about the quilt and then you can use the quilting to enhance or highlight that. Now, everybody, everybody's different and every quilt is different. So, you know, the most important thing might be the quilt pattern. Maybe it's that Judy Niemeyer paper pieced curved flying geese thing that's so amazing and you just want everybody to see how beautiful you did on it. Well, I would quilt those differently than I would if the fabric was my most important thing. Now, I know how us as quilters love to hoard, I mean, curate fabric. We use that fabric, we keep it, and we feel it, and then eventually we use it in a quilt, and then we're scared to quilt it, right? Well, if the fabric is the most important thing, we can use the quilting to highlight that. It could also be the recipient. You know, how I quilt a quilt for my nephew would be different than how I'd quilt it for a show. If I'm quilting for my nephew, of course I'm gonna quilt. Aunt Angela is your favorite over and over again. I mean, you gotta start that indoctrination while they're little. And then it could also be the inspiration, the story behind the quilt. So if you're looking at your quilt and there's this moving story behind it or a reason you made it, use that as your design inspiration because that's gonna help tell the story. And a side note, that doesn't have to be obvious to anybody but you. It's not like, you know, everybody should look at it and know exactly what you're talking about. And it could be the quilting. Now, this is maybe not quite as common. I know that sometimes um, people are like, well, I don't love quilting as much, but maybe you took a new challenge and you learned a new design and you wanna use it. If that's what you wanna do, go ahead and do it. There's no right or wrong way to quilt your quilts. Okay, so first let's talk about the pattern. This is the most common, most important thing because we spend a lot of time putting together this quilt. And I love to use my quilting to highlight any points that might look great or hide or detract from any points that might not be so good. 
So I'm gonna use quilting to show off the good stuff and hide the bad. And this particular quilt is a perfect example. Now, if you watch the Midnight Quilt Show, you might have seen this one. This is the Pathfinder quilt, and the pattern was so striking. I loved the different size triangles, and I really wanted to show it off. So when the pattern is the most important thing, using echoing is the best tip I can give you to highlight it. Now, echoing is just quilting that same shape, you know, a set distance away from it. And in this particular quilt, what I'm doing is I'm echoing those blocks. I'm echoing the outside of the colored portions. Echoing just puts a little bit of a parentheses around it, just kind of helps separate it from the filler and really show it off. So I'm probably not gonna do something like this around a block that I didn't do such a great job piecing or a block that doesn't have my favorite fabric. This is how I'm gonna show off and emphasize those main elements and really help separate it from the filler. And I have another example. This is actually a quilt piece by Julie Herman from her book, Alphabet Soup. And I love how the stylized letters make that beautiful kind of home word. And she has the book does all different kinds of letters. Well, the most important thing is those letters. And so using the echoing around each of the blocks just separates it from the filler. Now, since the block's the most important thing, I feel like doing dense quilting around the outside just really kind of helps squish that down so the block kind of pops out. Now, I don't have a degree in art or anything. I mean, I have a degree in fast food with a minor in French fries, if I, if I must say, I'm kind of proud of that. Um, but I think smushing down an area to make something else pop out sounds pretty artistic enough. So echoing is really, really gonna help you do that. Now, what if the fabric is your favorite thing? When somebody brings me a quilt and they say, how should I quilt it? It has all my favorite, you know, kaif fabrics or has all these beautiful, bright, busy fabrics. I always say, it doesn't matter because you're not gonna see the quilting anyway. And that could be good, right? It's a great place to practice. But if you're working with those busy, bright, focal fabrics, one thing you can do is go around the elements in the design. One of the, one of the benefits of quilting for Tula Pink is she's already done all the work. All I have to do is travel along the lines that she's put there with the fabric. Now, if I'm going around some of the elements in that fabric piece, I'm not going around every single thing. And you can see in this picture, it's not like I'm detailing every little element to that cute little bug, but I'm kind of going around, giving it the idea of the lines. And so this is gonna help really kind of make it pull out. Now, what's nice about this technique is you can decide within a piece of fabric what you wanna show off and what you wanna hide. So if you're working on a quilt with a lot of different things, but one of them is your favorite, go around that element and then just do an all over over the rest of it. Now, another example is you can use the quilting around that fabric to help highlight it. And again, another example of tulip pink fabrics. I mean, this beautiful Elizabeth fabric in the center of the block really doesn't need me to help highlight it, but you know, I'm gonna help show it off. So going around some of those elements in the face and then using designs that frame it around the outside, just gonna help kind of draw the attention to that beautiful fabric. So what you put around the fabric and in the fabric itself will really help do that. And of course, I have another example, that cute little raccoon guy in the center and more of those bugs around the outside. So again, it doesn't have to be perfectly on the line. It doesn't have to be around every element. We're just kind of going for the overall idea of the fabric. And on a side note, if you have a busy fabric and you think, oh, what should I quilt? Well, if there's flowers in the fabric, you can do a floral design. Or you can pull out one of your favorite colors. If you think, oh, I love the green, you could do a green thread. I think you can look to that, those things as inspiration and definitely use them to help you pick those designs. All right, so this is one of my favorite, the recipients. Now, this is kind of vague, kind of like the inspiration behind the quilt. It's, it's a vague kind of notion, but if you can bear with me, I think it might help you. So when I'm looking at a quilt, if I'm giving it as a special gift to somebody, which let's be honest, we're quilters, that's what we do. Most quilters give away way more quilts than they actually keep. I can take that recipient into mind. And so when somebody brings me a quilt and they're asking me how they should quilt it and they say they're gonna give it to you know, their, their son or their daughter or family member, I'll say, well, what kind of things do they like? What do, what do they wanna work with? Now this particular quilt might look familiar because it's that Pathfinder quilt again, except I quilted this for a friend who had just had a baby. So same pattern as that original one we saw, different fabrics, different recipient. I still love the pattern. The pattern is still amazing, but it's not quite the most important thing in this particular quilt. In fact, the little baby's name was Xavier, which is so cute. And I happened to realize that the six letters in his name just happened to fit the six triangles in the block. 
So if you look at the block on the left, it's kind of hard to see because I kept it a little subtle. I put a letter in each of those triangles and kind of spelt his name in the block. Something a little subtle, something for him. And then I know his family uh, very has a lot of faith, and so I quilted a scripture verse, but I quilted it upside down so that you could only see it on the back. So it's a hidden little thing on there. Again, pulling out what I knew that they loved really helped me do that. So if you're quilting it for somebody that loves flowers or pretty things, you can use that as an inspiration. Of course, if you are giving away a quilt, you do get to ultimately decide what you want to quilt. That's the most important thing. Okay, so we kind of gave an overview, a quick flyby over some different things. And I just want to show a couple more pictures, a couple more examples. And this is really what our live check-ins are going to look like throughout this challenge. So we'll have the tutorials, but then I'll have the live check-in where I'll show you pictures of other quilts that kind of follow the theme of what we've just learned. So for instance, next week, we're going to be doing nine patch blocks and plus blocks. So I'm going to show some quilts I've quilted with those blocks. And so this is meant to be kind of inspirational or, you know, kind of give you some ideas because really usually it's just the fact that we need to see them to kind of get those, those juices flowing. Um, so these kind of all have different things to do with quilting ideas, but gives you kind of a good idea of what it's going to look like throughout the challenge. Okay. When you're looking at your quilt and maybe nothing is your favorite thing, maybe you're thinking, I'm just glad this thing is finished. Maybe you started it on a dare. Maybe you did it retreat. I don't know. But if, if you're like, whatever, it's just going to be loved or I'm not sure what it's going to do, then you can use it as a challenge for yourself. Now, this particular quilt was also from the Midnight Quilt Show and it was a scrap buster quilt. And so it had a lot of bold, bright, busy fabrics, but they were all two inch strips finished. I love two inch strips because you can do a lot of fun, different designs in there. And so I decided I was going to try to quilt as many different designs in those strips as I could think of. And I could also rest assured knowing that if the quilting didn't turn out perfectly, it was going to be fine because the quilting wasn't super visible anyway. So giving yourself a little bit of that challenge, stretching yourself out of that comfort zone will really help get your ideas flowing. And if you get done with a particular block or even a quilt and you realize that you don't love it, well, sometimes knowing what not to do is just as important as knowing what to do. So this particular one, I did a lot of different designs and I did use red thread because I wanted to show up on camera. And you know, when I can get away with a wild thread, I love to use it. But you can see I've done wishbones and some starbursts and some different, different shapes. It's just a fun way to kind of get those ideas going. Or maybe you love the quilt, but it needs to be finished and you just can't make any more decisions right now at all. I've been there. I know what that's like. Just pick one or two, pick two or three, and then alternate between them. So this is a fruit slices quilt from the Midnight Quilt Show. And you can tell I'm using two designs over and over again. I'm doing those ribbon candy and those wishbones. Picking two designs that are easy for me to quilt and alternating between them kind of takes a lot of the, the choices out of it, kind of makes it easy and a little bit mindless. Maybe I was in the middle of a great book when I was quilting this, I don't know. Um, but keeping it nice and easy and that, that beautiful texture. And of course, continuous curve in the white squares because that's just an easy option. So you can really make it as complex or as easy as you like by doing all the designs or just a couple. Now, what about sampler quilts though? Now, this is actually a block from Build a Quilt, which is our block of the month program that we run out of our quilt shop and online. It's designed by me and we have a lot of fun doing that, but sampler quilts can be kind of tricky. You know, speaking of decision fatigue, not only do you have to figure out how to quilt this one block, you gotta figure out how to quilt all the blocks. Well, when I'm coming up against a sampler quilt, I really have two things that I try to do. First, I try to identify a background. Even if it's all the same fabric or it could be different fabrics, I say this print or this area is all gonna get the same design. And you can see in this block in that little pale dot background, I just did swirls. I like to do something easy in at least most of the quilt or half of the quilt to make it a little bit, you know, less stressful on myself. So identifying a background really helps. And then identifying versatile designs that I can use in a lot of different ways. So continuous curve, as you can see in those green points of the star, that's something that we're going to see a lot in this challenge because I want to use designs or learn designs that I can put in a lot of different areas. And so knowing that continuous curve, as well as the dot to dot, that geometric kind of diamond shape in the upper right corner of the block, those are really going to be nice and versatile and I can use them in a lot of different ways. And that means I do have to make a decision, but at least it's a decision that I'm pointed in a direction. So working on sampler quilts 
definitely helps with that. So I know that's not a whole lot of, of uh, examples. I, I could sit here and probably talk all day with pictures and stuff, but I just want to give you a quick overview of some different things to think about when you're picking designs. And of course, we're going to revisit this quite often throughout the challenge, which is going to be seven weeks, including this live kickoff. So what do you think about that? Coming up with questions yet, hopefully. I'm going to switch off the slideshow. And we're going to start taking some of your questions. Now, Wendy has been so great to kind of keep track of some of those. So, Wendy, what did we feel like was one of the most common questions that was asked? Um, one of the ladies would like to know if you're going to teach both how to use a midarm and a domestic. Good question. And I forgot to identify that. So am I going to demonstrate it on a sewing machine and a long arm or where I move the machine and not the fabric? Yes. So I'll be showing both of them. Um, how I've done it in previous channels, ch previous challenges, is I demonstrate the bulk of the design on a sewing machine and then I show a little, uh, little bit of it on the long arm. Now how the design goes together is the same no matter what kind of machine you use. And I usually tell people, you know, try not to get too hung up on whether you have the biggest or best or whatever you have. Just use what you've got and I'm sure it'll work. And so yes, we'll definitely have both of those with the challenge. And they would like to know, what is your favorite machine to quilt with? My favorite machine to quilt with? Well, I should say I'm a handy quilter dealer. So of course I have a handy quilter long arm. I was a long arm, I was a handy quilter owner before we opened the shop and became a dealer afterwards. I love the company and I love the, I love the machine. That's my baby. And then on my sewing machine, I have an HQ stitch. And so I love that as well. I mean, it has beautiful decorative stitches. I don't ever use those. It has a buttonhole, no thanks. But definitely has that nice wide, uh, nice big throat space, and that's all the always demonstrating on that machine. But again, you use what you have, and you'll be successful with it for sure. Are we going to be using a ru any rulers? And what suggestion is a good one to start with? So, are we going to be using rulers? Yes. So when I put together the designs for this challenge, I tried to have a range of things. So for each block, there's gonna be three to four designs. One is a little bit more basic in how it goes together and it kind of adds a little bit more steps as we go up. I use a ruler a lot in my quilting because I love to use it for stitching in the ditch to help me get from point to point. And I also use it a lot on the long arm. Now, I'm gonna demonstrate with a ruler, but I do demonstrate some of it without the ruler. You don't have to have it although I do like my slim ruler. So slim is about hand size, if it's perfectly in the throat space that you have. Um, I think a good straight edge ruler is the best one to start with because you can do a lot of stitching the ditch, the, the geometric quilting. You can kind of get comfortable with holding it because in the beginning it feels a little bit like a, you know, a third hand, but soon you'll be whipping it around like a ruler ninja. So you don't have to have it, but I'll be demonstrating with slim. That's my favorite. Um, or if you want the longer ruler, the HQ straight edge is uh, three by 12 inches. It's a little bit bigger, so that's kind of nice too. A lot of questions about what size of needle do you suggest with the glide thread? Okay, size of needle with the glide thread, depending on sewing machine versus long arm. I'm guessing sewing machine was the question there. Um, so the needle is dependent on the thread size. The thread is 40 weight. And now I got to see if it, to test my memory. It's either a 9014 or an 8012, and I'm pretty sure it's an 8012. So I'm going to use a needle that uses, that's for 40 weight thread. Although if I'm being honest with you, I kind of switch in between them depending on whichever one I happen to have closer. So even though it is a 40 weight, it's not quite, you know, it's not super, super thick. So you shouldn't see a big jump in needle size when you go from a 50 to a 40. And what bobbin thread do you suggest with the glide? I love this. Thank you, Wendy. I love that Wendy's just looking at the questions. Normally I kind of get you know, uh, stuck when I'm looking at the questions. So this has been really helpful. Um, oh, bobbin thread. I was like, I already forgot what the question was. Um, when I'm quilting with glide, you can use glide in the bobbin thread. And so you would just wind that up or you can use a different thread if you don't want to put the shiny on the back. It's up to you. It really depends on the look that you're going for. One of the great things about quilting with thread is that you don't have to use the same type on top and bottom. You don't have to use the same weight and you don't even have to use the same color, even though I per usually prefer to use the same color. If I'm being honest with you, I happen to have some pre-wound sewing machine bobbins that are light gray. So I just use those because I don't want to have to wind a bobbin. But if you want to put glide on your bobbin thread, it definitely works. Just wind a little bit slower and just make sure that it, it starts off perfect and then it will just wind beautifully. So um, you can definitely use it in the bottom as well if you want to see the quilting on the bottom. Now there are other threads that people will put on the bobbin if they don't want to see it on the back.
But I figure, you know, you've got two sides of the quilt, you might as well see the quilting on both of them. Um, is there any specific feet they need for their machine that you suggest? Okay, so when it comes to free motion feet, there are a lot of options out there. So for the most part, I say just grab the closest one to you and put it on your machine. Sometimes having too many options will paralyze us and we won't know where to start. So different feet have different uh, benefits. So if I'm gonna use a ruler, I'm gonna use a ruler foot. Now a ruler foot is just a higher profile foot. It keeps that ruler from sliding over because if the ruler slides over your foot, then your needle will hit the ruler. It'll break your needle, break your ruler, and then you'll pee your pants. And I mean, I, that's what I hear. It happened to a friend, it wasn't me. Um, but so definitely is a higher one. So I just leave my ruler foot on almost all the time. I just free motion quilt with it. Um, but there's open toed feet. If you really wanna see if you're doing some smaller quilting and you really wanna see where you're in there, um, the round, just regular closed toe foot is a good option because the spacing between the needle and the edge of the foot is the same from the front to the side, no matter where you are. Or there's also a dynamic one. So there's one that kind of hops and that's great if you're working with quilts with bulky seams. So if you're like, I don't know which one to use, just use your regular closed toe foot or whichever one you have handy, it's gonna be fine. Wanting to know where to start to quilt my quilt. On the panel? This place to start on the panel. So on the panel, what we're gonna do is next week, we're gonna see the nine patch blocks. And I've designed the panel so that it's in rows. So we're gonna kind of work from our way top down. And so that's where we're gonna start um, with the, the nine patch. Now, I know that kind of brings up the question and I kind of like struggled with, oh, how do I do this? because some of us like to start in the middle of the quilt. And usually I'll start in the middle, but I wanted to kind of follow a set routine so that you would know exactly what's coming next. There wouldn't be any questions. I've learned from previous challenges that most of you are very anxious to know exactly where things are so it can just look like, like they're supposed to look or like you think they're supposed to look. So we're gonna start from the top and work our way down. Of course, these videos will be on YouTube indefinitely. So if you wanna wait till they're all ready, if you wanna start in the middle and come back later, if you're on a long arm and you don't want to take it off and put it back on, you can definitely come back to it later and start wherever you want. But for the, for the videos, we're going to start top and work our way down. Lots of batting questions. What mm -hmm. batting do you recommend? Do you use spray basting, pens? All the sandwiching things. Yes. Okay, so batting is really what makes the quilt. And honestly, it doesn't matter what kind of batting you use as long as it's a quality batting. Some of my earlier quilts that I quilted, I like to call them vintage Angela, which means they're pretty crappily quilted, but we still use them. Um, I didn't use the best batting. I used that cheaper kind of thin stuff and they're bearding. So little pieces of batting are coming out of the quilt, which I mean, I kind of like pulling on them. So that's kind of fun for me. Uh, but if you use a high quality batting, that's gonna help protect that from happening. Now the type of batting you use just depends on your preferences. Don't you like that answer? I always tease my classes. The answer is always, it depends. Um, but it does depend. So I like to use a polyester batting because it resists creasing. And since I travel a lot, I have my samples folded up in you know, suitcases. It doesn't get as wrinkly as a natural fiber would. But natural fiber has a beautiful drape. It's nice and soft and cuddly, uh, but it does have that memory. So if it's gonna be a quilt for a bed or something like that, then you can use a natural fiber like cotton or wool or a bamboo silk blend or something like that. Then you have to decide how, how much loft do you want? How puffy do you want it? Well, it just depends on really what your preferences are. In general, I would go with a lower loft batting. If you're newer to machine quilting, it just kind of makes it less bulky and just pick a great quality one um, from a reputable brand. Now, when it comes to basting, I like to use the fusible batting. So the fusible batting, I can just iron it on and then just continue, but you could use pins. You can use spray based. Um, I just don't have a great space to spray, space to spray based, so I don't do that. And I don't love pins because they kind of stop me when I get into my, my, you know, my flow and I'm quilting, I'm like, oh, I gotta stop again. But for newer quilters, pins are actually nice because it gives you a reminder to stop and replay, you know, re reposition your hands. So you just have to kind of try one and see what works for you. And the best example I could say is, how do you know if you like Brussels sprouts? You try one, you'll know pretty quick if you like it or not. So try all three techniques, try one. If you like it, just stick with it. Whatever you do, just get those layers together so we can start quilting. I want it to look custom, but not quilted to death, and not edge to edge. Um, and to go along with that, can you over quilt? Okay, so that's a question that comes up a lot because I, and I should have said something about the quilts I was showing. I love to quilt things to death. Quilt too much and put more on it has always been my, has always been my motto. That's just, I like the look of it. Now, if somebody doesn't like the look of it, or you're worried that it will be too stiff, 
Well, you can spread out the spacing between your lines. Anybody watching that has taken a class with me in person has heard me say a million times, it's not the size of the design that determines the density, it's the spacing between the lines. So if you're doing swirls, just make the lines spaced out further. If you're doing a different type of design, just space those lines out and that's what's gonna give you that different density. Now, I know that keeping that spacing consistent is a little tricky at first uh, because, you know, we're kind of getting used to moving and just know that that will get easier as you get more comfortable with the free motion quilting process. If you're looking for something, you're like, I want it to be not all over, but not super custom, then use your quilting to highlight one area of the quilt, one favorite thing that you love about that quilt, and then just do an all over in the rest. In fact, a lot of the time, that's what I'm doing. I'm just putting one difficult thing in one or two areas and then doing an easier version in the rest of it. And of course, the more you do it, the easier it will be for you to know what you like and, and to get comfortable with that. What are your suggestions about stitching in the ditch? Ooh, stitching in the ditch, you just get ready because we're going to be stitching in the ditches. Okay, so stitching in the ditch is one of those kind of divisive things. You know, some people are like, I hate it. Some people are like, I love it. And it sounds weird, but I love it. I probably shouldn't love it with my personality, but I do because it helps me get to where I need to go. So when we're learning these designs, and it's, it's kind of tricky to try to teach all this within a little, little chunk, but not only do I want to learn how to quilt this design, I want to learn where I should use it, how to use it, and then how do I progress to the next one, right? It's, it's one thing to know how to quilt a swirl, but where should you add it and how do you get to the next one? And stitching in the ditch really helps me do that. So a lot of the designs that we are going to be learning don't necessarily have stitching in the ditch as part of the design, but I'm going to kind of hit on it when I say, look, if I want to get out, I'm going to just stitch along the seam and get out. Now, I don't know if this question's been asked, but this is usually the next question that comes after that, and it's usually, do, do I stitch in all the seams? I'm just using stitch in the ditch as a way to get to where I need to go, so if I don't hit every seam, I'm okay with that. Um, even if you can see it on the back. I figure I can only worry about one side of the quilt, it might as well be the front. So I'm stitching in the ditch while I'm quilting those blocks, and I'm, I'm using it to get where I need to go, and if that means a seam or two gets left undone, I'm okay with that. Now, you shouldn't do anything that I say and expect to win a ribbon at a quilt show. That probably won't happen. But for those quilts that we have, that we know and we want to love, just do what you need to do to move on. And, of course, you don't have to use stitching in the ditch. And we have time for one more question, Wendy. So who's it going to be? What's the best thing to get ready for next week? Okay, so to get ready for next week, are you excited? I'm so excited. I've been planning this for months. We've been working towards it. We have been cutting and answering emails and then cutting and then answering emails. And so next week is when the quilting actually starts. So go ahead and get your quilt sandwich basted and get it ready to start. Now, I know that not everybody has a panel and that's fine. That's not a requirement for the class. I wanna make sure that you don't have to have any of those things to practice. That's one thing I've always been adamant about. Um, so just get a piece of fabric and start quilting. Now, if you wanna, I don't have a pattern. That was one question that came up. Do I have a pattern for the panel? No, I don't, I, but they're very basic blocks. You can either mark them out on a quilt and create your own little whole cloth, or I'm sure you have some orphan blocks laying around that will work. Um, somebody else also asked what size are the blocks? Six inches roughly, it was just, it's designed on a, you know, a big kind of grid, so I'm not sure the exact size, but that'll give you a rough, a rough idea of where to start. It doesn't matter what you quilt on, it just matters that you practice. If you wanna get better at machine quilting, you have to practice. But one other thing I have to say, I'm, like, I'm getting on my soapbox, but the panel was designed as a tool so that you could have a finished project when you're done, right? So that you wouldn't have to spend time piecing. There wouldn't be a hurdle for you to get to the quilting. And you know, cause it's really easy for me to be like, I don't know, I don't feel like making that. I do want to get better at quilting, but maybe later. I'm kind of trying to make it as easy as possible. But this thing, when you're done with it, it's going to be a beautiful quilt. It's not just a practice piece. This is gonna be a gorgeous project. And so I hope that you're not scared to quilt on your panel. I hope that you're not worried about that. The whole idea is to give us something fun to work on together. And when you're done, you're gonna have a beautiful quilt and you're gonna be so proud of how far you came in those six, seven short weeks. And I hope that you'll share pictures and, and, and you'll kind of cheer everybody else on on the Facebook group. Okay, a couple things real quick to wrap up some details. How about a sneak peek for next week's stuff. I put together a quick little sneak peek for you so you can see what we're working on. So next week is gonna be those nine patch blocks. 
And again, like I said, I'm trying to keep them nice and basic and then adding a little bit more. So we're gonna be doing things like continuous curve. We're gonna be seeing things like connecting points on our block to give it a different shape and how to create a secondary design with that block because you can't just take the block into account. You have to look at its placement within the whole quilt. So we're gonna to touch on those nine patch blocks and then we're gonna do a little bit of plus blocks, which are basically a nine patch with a different color placement. So those videos will be out on Monday and then your challenge will be to quilt that section of your panel with the designs that you loved, your own variations, or you can quilt it just like I've quilted it. So super excited about that. Um, a couple other things that will be out on Monday. So the videos will start regularly in the description box below this video. I have a, the whole schedule so you can see it. I have links to the Facebook group, to the email sign up. There's also links to some of the things I talked about. Um, the episode of Midnight Quilt Show where I did the Pathfinder um, a help. How do I quilt it class I have on Blueprint. Also some information about Build a Quilt. So that block of the month program only opens up for registration once a year and registration is open for next year. I'm super excited about it. Um, it's something that's a little bit different than the Free Motion Challenge quilting along. They just happen to be working along at the same time. Um, but it's a great way to make a customized quilt um, and you can participate online even if you're not in the area. So there's a link down there that'll take you to it as well. So Build a Quilt registration is open, but you wanna do it fast because we're gonna start pretty soon and you don't wanna miss out on that. Um, also, if you happen to be at Quilt Festival next weekend, I'll be there Saturday and Sunday, and I'll be in the Blueprint booth doing a meet and greet. So if you're going to be there, hopefully I'll see you. If not, I will see you on Monday when we do the first episode or the first video in the Free Motion Challenge Quilting Along. And I'm so excited to go on this journey with you. I cannot wait. But until then, get your stuff ready. Happy quilting. I'll see you soon.